Presenting Father Maguire, the fat chap in a flat cap. Viewer discretion is advised. Some of what you are about to see may shock you. It may astound you. You may want to see more. Fasten your seat belt. This could get bumpy. Only Technicolor. <laughs> Good afternoon, it is I, Father Maguire, and we're going to be undertaking the Module 2 Case Studies uh, Mock Exam today. Um, this is another part um, to get in towards actual driving a lorry. Um, I am currently waiting for my licence to come back from the DVLA, fingers crossed with the entitlements added, and then I can book my theory test, my hazard perception test, and this one, the case studies test. This one I actually have found it more difficult than the other two. Even though I failed my mock hazard perception on the video before, I have passed it, um, obviously, you know, and I will continue to practice once I know that I've actually got an exam booked because at the moment it could be weeks or months away and there's little point in me learning now to actually forget by the time I need to go and do it um, that what is required. So anyway, without further ado, let's get on with it. And this is being done with dtsanytime.co.uk. This is the school that um, my uh, training provider has set up. And you can see here, I'm ready to start the test. So I'm not sure how long you get, probably an hour, an hour and a half or something. We'll soon find out. So here we go. So it's an hour and a quarter that you get, and it's 50 questions. Um, Brian works for a large international chemical producer and drives an articulated truck all over Europe carrying various chemical products. His vehicle is fitted with a bunk and he normally uses ferries from the south of England to the eastern continent. The goods he carries are either palletized or in IBC. What do the letters IBC stand for? Um, well, I know this is something that you would get through your study. It's uh, intermediate bulk containers. That's what IBC stands for. Which of the following best meets the requirements for the carriage of fire extinguishers for vehicles carrying dangerous goods? Right, so it should be one in the cab and one in the load area. I think it's that one. One fitted inside the load compartment and one fitted exterior body of the vehicle is not right. One of fire extinguisher is not right, so that one's not right. So it's I think it's two fire extinguishers, one in the cab and one in or on the load area. I think I've read somewhere it's twelve kilograms, one of two and one of whatever ten or you know anyway it's twelve kilograms to be two of them um to be met the standard. What is the minimum length of a daily rest period? That is taken in the cab of the vehicle fitted with the bunk. Minimum uh, nine hours. Because you can have a 15 hour day with driving and other work, which leaves you with nine hours um, to get into a 24 hour period. That's the minimum. Brian arrives at Portsmouth two hours before he is required to embark the ferry. He uses this period as the first part of his daily rest. Ferry crossing takes eight hours. For how long does he need to continue his rest before setting off after landing in St. Malo? Um, well, he's had two hours rest. It's going to be eight, so that's ten. If he, can, if he has actual eight hours of rest, um, so uh, 
after you. I've, I've thought I got this wrong before. I think it's it's one, but I think uh, on another side it could be two, because one will make it eleven hours. And I thought you had to do it three and nine. I, I think that I might get that one wrong. I think that might be two hours, but we'll see. Fingers crossed, it's right. Brian arrives at Portsmouth one hour before he is required to embark the ferry. He uses this period as the first part of his daily rest. Ferry crossing takes seven hours. For how long does he need to continue his rest before setting off after landing in Kane? Um, so that's eight hours. So I'm going to go with three because now I, that actually puts me to thinking I'm right on the, the other one because there isn't an option for four there, which would be 12 hours. So I'm thinking it's three. Brian has to undergo ADR training as well as his driver CPC training. Brian takes a full week, eight to 35 hours ADR training. How much of this can, can count towards his driver CPC qualification? Well, again, this is something that you'll find in study notes, 21 hours. If you do ADR training um, as well as CPC, 21 hours goes towards your CPC if you've done ADR. I know that again from your study material. What is the name of the organisation charged with accrediting centres for driver CPC training? What is the name of the organisation charged with accrediting centres? I've got a feeling. DVLA deals with licenses and logbooks and stuff. DVSA is the more likely. JAUPT, never heard of it. DFT, I mean, our, our Department of Transport, maybe? Or I don't think so. I'm going to go with DVSA again. Might get that one wrong. Don't Not good, really, considering I'm only on question eight. Right, new case study. So, Frank drives for a heavy haulage company based in the south of England. All of the company vehicles are specialist vehicles designed to carry exceptionally heavy loads under the special type general order of PGO regulations. It is common for Frank to be driving vehicles carrying loads in excess of 80 tonnes or in excess of 3 metres wide or 4 metres high. His vehicle is fitted with a speed limit digital crossover. What is the maximum train weight for a vehicle operating under STGO Category 2? Well, I can tell you because I know this uh, This is one I've read and read and read. STGO Category 1 is 50 tonnes, 2 is 80, and 3 is 150. So, Category 2 is 80 tonnes. What is the maximum height of a vehicle in the UK? Um, now, I don't think there is a maximum height. I might get this one wrong as well. I'm not absolutely sure about that, but something is niggling in the back of my mind saying there's no maximum height because you would be able to avoid maximum height bridges in places I don't know maybe it's five meters I'm going to stick with max there's no maximum height I've got a feeling that one is right I've got a feeling that's all it is if a vehicle exceeds a certain traveling height height marker must be displayed in the cab of that vehicle what is the height I think it's, it's three meters. I think. What is the minimum height of an unmarked bridge in the UK? 16 feet, 6 inches. I know that for sure. I've, I've had that question quite a few times. 
projecting load markers must be fitted where the load overhangs the side of a vehicle by a certain amount. What is that amount? I can tell you again, study materials, it's 305 mil on either side. That's, that's for sure. What category of driving license would be required to drive a three axle tractor unit coupled to a four axle semi trailer? Four axle semi trailer. I've got a feeling it's going to be C plus E with code 102. C plus E is to drive an Arctic, and this is a heavy goods um, or wide load or whatever, so I'm feeling that that's going to be a code 102. C1 plus E is going to be like um, an 18 ton lorry that can carry a trailer, um, you know, a rigid and then a trailer. C plus E is an articulated lorry, so therefore I don't think you would be allowed to drive a, a, a three axle and four axle with a C plus E. I think you'd have to have extra training for that, so I'm going to go with code 102. What is the speed limit for a vehicle operating under STGO? Category 2 on a motorway in the UK. Well, I can tell you now that they're all the same. 1, 2 and 3 STGOs are all 20 mile an hour, 30 mile an hour and 40 mile an hour. So 40 mile an hour is the maximum speed for them on a motorway. At what speed would the speed limiter be set for a vehicle operating under STGO Category 2 in the UK? Well, that's as fast as you can go on a motorway it, it doesn't really say where it doesn't really give you an idea of where so I'm going to stick with 40 on that it certainly can't be these two so. which of the following documents do David oh right sorry case study 3 David drives an articulated vehicle all over Europe carrying a variety of chilled or frozen food stuff his unit has a sleeper cab with a double bunk fitted. The semi trailer, once attached to the unit, is four metres high. David generally uses the Channel Tunnel to enter the UK from France, but does occasionally use the Portsmouth to Le Havre ferry for outward journey. Which of the following documents does David not need to carry when driving in Europe? I'm going to say birth certificate straight away. Because you're going to need your driving license. You are going to need a letter giving authority to drive the vehicle if it's not one you own. And you're going to need your passport. So I'm going to stick with birth certificate there. What is the maximum height of an articulated vehicle <laughs> in the UK? Again, um, if I get this wrong, I'm going to get two questions wrong here. I'm going to put there's no maximum height. Kick myself if I get this wrong and it's five meters or something. I should know that. So I'm going to go maximum height. What is the minimum height of an unmarked bridge? We've already been there. It's five meters, sixteen feet, six feet. Ah, so I'm. I think I'm right because that's five meters. I did wonder. I did wonder about. Five meters is sixteen foot six, and they expect you to be able to go under that with a normal load. So I'm feeling a bit more confident. I've got the others right now. In the UK, where the travelling height of a vehicle exceeds a certain limit, it must carry a height marker. What is that limit? Gotta be five meters, hasn't it? Because five meters is sixteen foot six, which is what most bridges would be. So it's got to be five meters. When using the ferry between Portsmouth and La Havre, David would interrupt his daily rest. Which of the following criteria are correct? The interrupt the daily rest period providing you access to a bunk or couch yet nearly right. Not the answer. You can interrupt daily rest period no more than twice. I 
I think it's he can interrupt the regular daily rest period no more than twice. It's to get on and off the ferry. In this one, he can interrupt the reduced daily rest period no more than twice. Um, I don't think that's right. I think they expect you to have a normal daily rest period over the ferry. David does interrupt his daily rest period to board or disembark the ferry. How long must the total daily rest period be? <laughs> I've been sticking with 11 hours. You're allowed to interrupt it with an hour. I'm gonna, I don't know, I'm gonna go with 12 on that because I know it said three and no. Got it, I'm gonna stick with 11. I'm gonna stick with 11. Something's telling me it's 12. What is the maximum width of David's vehicle? I think it's 2.75 metres because 305 mil takes it over three. Yeah. As the vehicle is fitted with a refrigerated unit, how may red diesel when you baited fuel be used legally? Has road fuel provided that you voluntarily pay any duty owed? That's not right. Is road fuel battle? Only as fuel for the refrigerated unit provided it uses a separate diesel tank. That's the correct answer. It's for the refrigerated unit, not for driving fuel. What is the maximum penalty for the driver if clandestine entrants are found on David's vehicle when he returns to the UK? It is £2,000 per body, per person. David is carrying some meat carcasses from Lyon to Paris. He notices the trailer swinging from side to side as he is entering and leaving roundabout. What could cause this? Um, I would say it, he is driving too close to the vehicle in front. It's not going to be doing that. The carcasses are swinging inside the semi-trailer because he is driving too fast. That is the right answer. Front suspension is faulty. I mean, that's going to just jolt him up and down. It's not going to make him swing. The fifth wheel needs adjusting. No, I, it's because he's driving too fast. Right, so Richard is driving a 40 ton articulated vehicle fitted with parabolic suspension. Curbside weight plus the driver is 18 tons. The vehicle is carrying steel beams which weigh one ton. Richard started work at 5am this morning, this Thursday now. He has had two reduced daily rests already this week due to put delays at customer premises and had to increase his driving hours once. Richard is paid a £10 bonus for driving fuel efficiently because he has completed a safe course. What is the maximum payload of this vehicle? Best answer. So it's a 40 ton lorry. Curbside weight is 18. So 40 minus 18 is 22. 22 ton. What is the maximum number of beams that can be placed on this vehicle? Choose the best answer. Well, the beams it says they weigh a ton each. He can hold 22 tons, so it's 22 beams. How many more times in this fixed week may Richard? Increases driving hours. Choose the best answer. Right, you're allowed to do a maximum of uh, 56. So 10, 20, 30. And you're six shifts. 39. That won't work. So it's 
think you're only allowed to do it twice, aren't you? You can reduce your daily rest three times, but you can only do two days of increased driving hours. So it's once. He's already done one. It's once, to be honest with you. How many more times this week may Richard reduce his daily rest? Choose the best answer. He has had two reduced the daily rest this week. So basically what it is, um, it's once. Because he goes 9, 18, 27. Oh no, hang on a minute. You can reduce your daily rest. Two day reduced daily rest already this week. You can do three 15 hour shifts. So you can do three daily rests to do. So that's one. One. Because he's already had two. Sometimes I've confused myself with it. What would be the best equipment to use to secure this load? Steel beams is chains and tensions. How can Richard keep his bangers for fuel efficient driving? Choose the best answer. By switching the engine off when queuing to get on the loading bays. Yeah, probably. By keeping the red counter in the yellow band, no. By getting to the customers as quickly as possible to minimise the running time, no. By not using the cruise control, it's by switching the engine off when queuing to get on the loading you don't you don't use uh, you don't not use cruise control on motorways on any carriage way. You don't. Which characteristic is associated with steel sprung suspension? Choose the best answer. Environmentally friendly as it allows more weight to be carried by the vehicle. Non environmentally friendly as it increases damage to the roads and damage to buildings through vibration. Environmentally friendly as it creates a smoother ride and less damage to the road. Environmentally friendly as it reduces damage to the roads and damage to buildings through vibration. I'm going to go with that one. I'm not entirely sure on that one. But I think it's environmentally friendly as it reduces damage to the roads and damage to buildings through vibrations. Because, yeah, it makes, I think that's Richard has driven for 10 hours on Friday and Saturday. Due to the volume of deliveries, he has been asked to do 10 hour drives on Monday and Tuesday. Is this legal? Who's the best answer? This is legal as Richard has only increases twice in each six weeks. This is, is illegal as he would have driven 58 hours in his working week. This is legal as long as he is not paid for the extra hours. Well, that's not right. This is illegal as he can only increase his driving to 10 hours twice a week. Well, that's true. But Monday's the start of a new week. Because a working week starts from midnight Monday morning. Well, sorry, I should say uh, 0001 on Monday to zero 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 on Sunday and it's worked out over two weeks. As long as he reduces his drive time because you're only allowed to drive for 90 hours over a period of two weeks, he should be allowed to do that. If that this is illegal as he would have driven 58 hours in his working week is incorrect because the working week ends on a Sunday and it starts on a Monday. So I think it's this is legal as Richard only increases twice in each six weeks. That's that's what I think. In terms of record keeping, which of the following statements is true when Craig drives the Esk? I fucking hate this question, honestly. I had, I've had to look this up two or three times. Um, He must make a manual entry on his digital tachograph. I don't think that's right. He does not need to keep a record because the vehicle is under three and a half tons. I don't think that's right. He must keep a tachograph record. I don't think that's right either. I think it's he must keep a record. I've read in one of the questions it was something to do with he makes a, 
a note of his hours in a book or something like that. I think that's it. Again, could be wrong, but I've got a feeling. Under the Working Time Directive, what is the maximum number of hours that trade can work in any one week? It's 56. I didn't even read the case study. As well as driving articulated vehicles under STGO rules, trade often drives a three and a half ton rigid panel hull liveried as an escort vehicle. A vanish fitted with a hands free fence. Craig generally drives his vehicle when doing overtime on their weekends, in addition to his normal duties as an SUV driver. Craig averages a 48 hour working week. Uh, and the answer to that, under the working time directive, what is the maximum number of hours that Craig can work in a, any one week? It's 56 hours. What is the maximum number of hours that Craig can drive in any six weeks? I think it's 56 hours uh, spent driving this van. Yeah. What's the minimum license required to drive a three and a half ton van? C's to diesel. Uh, what the hell's category A? It's got to be a car license, hasn't it? Category A. I wonder if that's motorbike, I'll have to check, I'm not sure, but I think it's category B. It's not a 7.5 ton lorry and that's not even listed on here anyway. Escort vehicles such as these are permitted to show flashing beacons when they are escorting a large load. What colour beacons should be used? Orange. It's got orange lights on it. Two days advance notice to the police is Required when a vehicle or its load exceeds what width limits? I think it's three and a half meters. Got a feeling. Could be wrong on that one. Not really sure. What is using a hands free phone likely to do? Divert your attention, reduce your view to the front, improve your safety in seconds, and that increase your cut now. It's going to divert your attention. Health and safety would dictate that's the right answer. Which of the following items lists the likely effects or effects of using a handheld phone when driving? Loss of control of the vehicle and a maximum fine of two and a half thousand pound in court. Greater awareness of possible dangers. Nope. You could be fined a maximum of. Faster reactions is wrong, you could be finding that. I'm going to say it doesn't say you're using the hands free thing. A handheld phone when driving, loss of control of the vehicle, and a maximum fine of two and a half grand. That's what I think. You could be fined a maximum of a thousand pounds in court, yeah, but you could also lose control more importantly, and I think that's it. Okay, case study six, we're nearly there. Uh, John is a self-employed owner-driver who uses his own three-axle articulated unit to pull customers' trailers throughout the UK. He does not own any trailers himself. His vehicle is 2.8 metres high. John has six penalty points naughty boy, on his licence relating to two speeding offences that he incurred some three years ago. Both were received following offences whilst riding his motorcycle. That's how I get points nowadays if I had a bike. Um, if John is asked to produce his insurance documents by a policeman, how long does he have to do so? Uh, seven days. Sure. On reaching a certain number of points within a specific period, a driver would usually lose their license under the totting up procedure. How many points would cause this to happen? Twelve or more. We all know that, I think, if you're a driver. You know it's going to be 12. John often pulls step frame curtain sided semi trailers with a height of 4.2 metres. What does this mean for John? Nothing because there is no height limit in the UK. Four point two meters is not sixteen foot six, is it? Nothing because there is no height limit in the UK. Yeah, 
this is this is the difference between passing and failing right here he will need to display a height marker in the cab because the overall height exceeds three meters i think it's that Because the trailers, when they come made, have heights on them. But I think you still have to have markers inside your cab telling you what height your trailer is so you know when you're coming up to bridges. I've got a feeling it's three metres. Could be wrong. What are high cube semi trailers more likely to be affected by than flatbed semi trailers? Strong wind. Fog, heavy rain, heavy traffic, heavy spray on dual carriageways and roads. It's strong wind. After coupling up a trailer, what is the last thing that John should do? Raise the trailer leg. I've checked that one a few times as well. Yeah, raise the trailer leg. John is stopped by DVSA and the semi trailer is found to have a badly worn tyre on the offside rear wheel. Who could be prosecuted? Nobody providing John has carried out his day, that's not true. Uh, it's going to be John only, I think, because he is the one responsible for taking a vehicle on the road or doing his check um, to make sure that it's road legal. Rather than prosecuting John for the worn tyre, the DVSA officer offers him a graduated penalty within what period of time must this be paid? Uh, I'm completely guessing at this, but I know that if you get a parking ticket, it's 28 days before the, the amount goes up that you have to pay. Um, and I think it's the same when you get on the spot fines at the roadside, I think it's 28 days. Again, I'm pretty much guessing. John is aware that competition is great within the industry and any slight advantage over his competitors is worthwhile. How can he improve fuel efficiency? By fitting low rolling resistance tyres and a roof air deflector to his cab. By holding on to the lower gears for longer. No. By pulling high cube trailers whenever possible. No. By under input is that one. It's by fitting low rolling resistance tyres and a roof air deflector to his cab. Last question, thanks. I'll look for it. John is aware that competition is great within the industry and any slight advantage over his competitors is worthwhile. How can he improve fuel efficiency through his driving thing? By letting the engine warm up on tick over before driving it away, by keeping the red counter in the red band as long as possible, definitely. By leaving his braking by using forward planning and observation techniques to drive smoothly and gently. That is the correct answer. So it's a strange way I have to end this because he's not got an extra review. Um, and it's so just basically saying there that I've answered 50 or 50 and it's taken me just over half an hour. But I'm not going to muck about and come back and change. Let's just see what happens. Oh dear. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Oh, I think I've passed. So what do we get wrong? Let's have a look at what we got wrong. Then. Oh, it's that one. What is the name of the organisation charged with accrediting centres for driver CPC training? Is JAUPT. Still never heard of it. In fact, I'll tell you what, while we're here, let's have a look. JAUPT. Joint Approvals Unit for Periodic Training. At least we know. Job. Okay. What category? Oh, C4T. I didn't know that. Right, okay. So you can drive a four axle semi trailer on a normal C4T. That's another one to remember. Definitely. Another one to remember. Okay. What speed will the speed limit be set? Right. I don't get that. Because if you're carrying, I mean, 56 is what it is for all vehicles. But if you're operating under SG, 
SDGO Category 2, that says to me you're carrying some heavy and you should be driving at 40. That's a bit misleading, that one, I think. Let's say it's 56, but it's there. Uh, oh, that's, that's why I've got me, me uh, <laughs> where the travelling height of the vehicle exceeds a certain limit, it must carry a height marker. What is that limit? I've, I've answered that one right further on, haven't I? Because I put three metres on another one. So it, it's it's three metres. What is the maximum width of Davies trailer? 2.6. Right, another one to remember, not 2.75 like I thought. Which characteristic is associated with steel sprung suspension? So the actual answer is non-environmentally friendly as it increases damage to the roads and damage to buildings. I remember that, non-environmentally. Under the working time directive, what is the maximum number of hours that Craig can work in any one week? 60. Okay. Okay, alright. I'm thinking speed, I think, is 56 hours for a second there, but it's 60. Okay. What's the maximum number of hours that Craig can drive in any fixed week? So the correct answer is 56 hours, excluding hours spent driving. Right, so, okay, excluding driving that van. Right, one I remember. Uh, when a two days notice to the police is required, when a vehicle will load it, of course it's going to be 2.9, because if it's 2.6 wide, and you've got that 305 mil, which makes it a wide load, it's going to be 2.9. Okay. Release the pay. Oh my God. Why didn't I get that right? I should have had that easily right. So, end review. Oh, get in. Even though it's a bit of brown trousers time, I passed 80%. I've got 40 out of 50 right. And that, folks, I haven't done any studying for three weeks. So, there you go. Uh, not going to mess about and waffle on. Um, I'm going out on uh, Thursday this week. I'm going for a trip over to Derby Hospital for, for a, seeing a consultation. So I should be doing a, a driving video on Thursday. Um, thank you very much for being here. If you've enjoyed the video, please do subscribe if you don't already. And give me a thumbs up if you liked it. Hope this helps you and you can see that, you know, it's not that easy, this one. I'll be honest, out of the three, out of the theory test, out of the hazard perception, and this one, I found this one to be the most difficult. And if I'm brutally honest with you, let me just show you this here. I can get it out of here without trashing everything. That's a pad. That's not the right one. Noob. This is my work, the case studies. That's all my writing on the front of there is like crib notes as well. But that is everything to do with case studies and nothing to do with the theory test, which I've got another book over there. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much for being here, folks. I do appreciate it. Um, I will be back sometime later in the week um, after I've done my uh, trip to Derby, which will do a little bit of recording. And uh, take care for now. Father McGuire out.